Cimarron is the Best Picture Oscar winner from 1931, directed by Wesley Ruggles, and it follows the story of this man called Yancey uh, across several decades of, of, of a lifetime, really, um, and the building of America. You know, that from, from the time that people got there and staked their claim on pieces of land, um, you know, sidestepping the, the, the whole wiping out of the indigenous people, we kind of get to the, you know, for anyone who's seen Ron Howard's Far and Away, we, we get to that period in America where, no, the, the, the white man is there now, he's, he's well and truly claimed ownership, uh, but now he's, he's offering the land out to anyone who wishes to take the, the American dream, the American dream, you know, go out, plant your flag, the land is yours. That's how we start the film. And yeah, we go, you know, from, from the moment that Yancey stakes his claim all the way through to his inevitable death. And it, it is a look at the life of this man and his family. It's widely regarded, from what I can see, as one of the worst Best Picture Oscar winners ever made. And I gotta say, I completely disagree. <laughs> <laughs> this film is nowhere near as bad as people make out. Not even close. I don't know if this is me contradicting myself. Uh, if it is, then shame on me, but I, I don't think it is. Um, so when I reviewed the Broadway melody, there was things about that film. I mean, I hated that film. I just hated it. Um, but I did say that you had to, you know, you have to give context for, for certain things from a certain period. You know, that sometimes you, you can't always judge the moral stance or the position that, you know, that, that a film takes based on modern standards. You have to look at where society was at the time the film was made. Now, even doing that, with the likes of the Broadway melody didn't help me to like the film at all. Trying to put myself in the 1929 context did not make it acceptable enough for me that the film went where it went. Um, because, because it wasn't striving for any particular ideal. It was just saying, look, women are second-class citizens and that's okay. Um, whereas this film, I think it's criticized my my guess from, from from what i can see as well you know i've looked at some reviews after the fact and, and a lot of the criticism tends to be the same which is particularly that the, the whole white man savior thing the whole um indigenous people not really having a voice in this film the underrepresentation big time of it the misrepresentation of black people minorities that kind of thing um, and yeah, I agree. I watch that stuff and I go, oh, you know, there's a particular scene with, with this black kid who's hanging from, from a, a light. He's, he's essentially the, a slave. Um, he's, he's one of the slaves of this rich white household uh, that Yancey is kind of marrying into. And it's cringe. It's just, you watch this scene and you're like, oh, okay. Here's what separates this film from the likes of the Broadway melody. And you may not agree with it. You may think that, again, it's, it's, it's liberals trying to put themselves in, in the position of saviors and, and, and this, that, and the other. Uh, but, it, but they're the people that I think today are actually criticizing the film, not giving it its due context. Um, here's the thing. It has an ideal, okay? The, the, the character that is at the center of this film, this Yancey character, um, who, who sh takes us through this you know, building up of this town into a city, into into what America becomes at the point of 1930. He has moral fibre. Um, you know, he, he, he has an idealistic way of looking at life where everyone can get along, where everyone should be equal, um, and where we should strive to be better. You can criticise that and say, well... He's a white man. Uh, if, if white man had, had have actually acted like that, then America wouldn't have been built the way it was. Um, so again, it's the whole, yeah, try, trying to make ourselves look better than we were uh, in, in the building of America. And, and that's a fair criticism. I get that. But it was also white men who, you know, abolished slavery. 
are, are fought for the abolition of slavery. So there were men on both sides of the fence. It's not like this character, as embodied by Yancey, didn't exist at all. Like there were, you know, there were no William Wilberforces. Hello, white man, trying to abolish slavery. You know, it, it, so, so that argument kind of falls a little bit flat for me. Um, but yeah, the the representation of indigenous people and black people that to me doesn't date very well. But again, within the context of the time this film was made, it's surprisingly liberal. It's it it did surprise me actually how liberal it was. And I would imagine a lot of those liberals that seem to be filling up letterbox with constant reviews these days about all manner of you know LGBT this and and uh, minorities that and tearing a film like Simmering down because it doesn't match the modern day standards of what morality should be. These are the same people that had they been alive back in 1931 would be praising this film for its liberal attitudes, for just how much and how far it goes to try and be kind to the people that were wronged. Now, I'm not saying they do a good job of it. I'm not saying that it's, it's, it's a worthy film uh, in, in the vein of, you know, you look at something more recent like Killers of the Flower Moon, which deals essentially with all the same stuff, but in a much more real way. You know, I, I think... Killers of the Flower Moon is essentially the, the response to a film like Cimarron through modern eyes. When you look at Cimarron through modern eyes and you go, ooh, okay, bad form. How, how should that film really look? Killers of the Flower Moon is what you get. Now, that's great. We can pat ourselves on the back and say, how great are we now that we've come to those realizations? But there's 90 years of difference in social growth between Cimarron and Killers of the Flower Moon. You know what I mean? So I look at this film and yeah, there are things in it that make me cringe, that, that, go, that make me go, well, that doesn't sit too well today, does it? Um, but I also look at it in the context of, you know what, where were people at in 1931? And when I do that, there is things in this film that I think are actually quite noble, quite um, moral, shall we say, that, that, that are trying to, to do right, that are trying to present a world where we can all live and try do better, try and be better, um, which may sound a bit preachy. And I think that that's one of the things the film does suffer from. It does get a bit preachy. I mean, at time, there are times in the film when Yancey preaches, literally. There's a scene where he, he, you know, he's asked to preach at the local church that they've just set up and, you know, he gives this whole thing from the Bible, which is probably one of the reasons I like this character so much, uh, is that, you know, this is back in the days when characters could really, yeah, speak the truth of the gospel and not, and not be those weird little cliquey Christian fractions on the, on the outside. Um, yeah. It's not a perfect film, obviously, as I think you can tell from, from my toing and froing with regards to the moral quandaries that befall you when watching it through modern day eyes, but it, it's, it's engaging. You know, I was never bored, which is quite remarkable given the age of the film. You know, it's 1931, it's 90, 92, 93 years old. It's like, I, I should be bored. I came to this expecting to be bored. But, uh, but, but even from a visual standpoint, there are things that happen in this film where I'm like, damn, they, they really went for broke on that, didn't they? You know, the, the whole sequence at the beginning when they're, they're trying to stake the land, when, uh, when they literally just, they let the line go up and then all these hot men on horses and women on horses and they're just, they're just going for it. And, and the camera's right in there with them, right in the middle and you think, blimey. I bet some stuntmen got hurt on that one. You know, back in the time before CGI, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, that looks pretty hairy. Coming off the back of something like the Broadway Melody, which is just dull, which is like, let's just stick a camera here and leave it for three minutes while they do a musical on stage. That's, that's not film, that's theatre. Film, that's filmed theatre. There's an engaging story here that sometimes has peaks, sometimes has valleys 
um, but at least has a vision, has... I, I know what it's trying to say by the end of it, and I appreciate what it's trying to say, um, even if it doesn't quite say it in always the best, most truthful way. The film does have, again, that bizarre trope that that was in uh, the Broadway melody of having the, the stammering fool. Now here, he, I, I don't get the sense it's played for laughs. I made a comment with the Broadway melody. There was a character in there that had a stammer and I just felt like, one, it was just in poor taste. It, was, it seemed like it was there for humour. And then I said, well, maybe it was there for the sake of inclusion. Well, I feel like here, it is there for the sake of inclusion. I feel like maybe people didn't appreciate the, 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 the fact that it, people like this were being taken the piss out of in something like the Broadway Melody. And then a couple of years later, they put a character in who, yeah, he's got a stammer, but I never feel like we're being asked to laugh. It's just, he's given a job by Yancey and it ties you into the fact that it, it says more about Yancey than it does about the man with the stammer. It's like, the man, Yancey doesn't see someone with a stammer. He doesn't see someone with black skin. He's He just... He takes on everybody. He brings them in, he gives them jobs, he defends people's rights. And, and that's a character that's worth having on screen, whether he's white or, and, and shouldn't be or not. It, yeah, again, modern day liberals, I think this film has most of what modern day liberals hate, which is why they will hate this film. But I think if you, if you come to it with your perspective goggles on, with your context, goggles on then you'll get something out of it maybe that's just me i don't know i it's just maybe just my sensibilities i could be wrong uh but yeah if you've seen simmering i'd like to know what you think is it as bad as a lot of people make it out to be or is it actually a pleasant surprise for you let me know down in the comments section below thank you for watching this review and until next time cracking